Generally, in uh, mainstream cinema, image and sound, they direct attention. They present and develop characters and the narrative. All the elements that appear in an image, including sound, have a singular function, a stable identity, and are set in a hierarchy to direct the eye to the unfolding of uh, some drama. Whatever the dynamism of such an image, its flow is locked image to image to the demands of the narrative. But as soon as I started watching Ghatak's uh, cinema, it was obvious that the image for him was something totally uh, different. In uh, Ritik Da's work, again and again, and in Titash, uh, brilliantly, extravagantly, uh, we see a traumatically intense uh, interrogation of the pastoral impulse. Nothing ever stops moving. And that is the irrepressible movement within every image and sound in Titash. Any community that seeks to escape history, to deny change, needs uh, sacrificial uh, victims. Historically, and even today, we can see how a community will sacrifice what is best about it. I don't think we can allow the ending of the film to tell us what life is or is not. I would say, you know, that the whole experience of the film should suggest to us where uh, the Tikda actually stands uh, in his relationship to life. Stories do not affirm truths, but encourage questions and never tiring speculation. It is out of this sense of story, which is stories, people who are peoples, landscape, which is history, terrains, which carry traditions. It is out of all these elements then that a certain idea of juxtapositions, of montage, then arises. Hello everyone, welcome to Filmcopath. Today is the birthday of legendary filmmaker Rithik Ghatok. I cannot even begin to describe the magnitude of the contribution of Ghatok to Indian cinema. Ghatok carried the pain of partition in his heart and that was the core theme of a majority of his cinema. Rithik Ghatok has inspired a generation of filmmakers with his cinema and teaching. Among his students were stalwarts of Indian parallel cinema movement like Adur Gopalakrishnan, John Abraham and Kumar Sahani. It is fair to say that Rithik Ghatok was an underappreciated genius of world cinema. We here at Filmcopath very humbly want to remember and celebrate him through his cinema. Today we start our series with the Indo-Bangladeshi film production Tita Shekti Nodin Nam or A River Called Titash which looks at the stories of fishermen who reside on the banks of River Titash. To discuss this film, we have the privilege of having with us renowned filmmaker Mr. Anup Singh. Mr. Anup's first film was a tribute to Ghatok called Ekti Rudin Nam, the name of a river. It was selected in 30 festivals worldwide and won several awards. His film Kissa, The Tale of a Lonely Coast, premiered at Toronto in 2013 and was critically acclaimed. The film won the Best Asian Film by Netpack, the Silver Gateway Award at the Mumbai Film Festival. Hence, we cannot possibly have anyone other than him to discuss Tita Shekti Nodin Nam. Anupji, thank you so much for joining us today. It is an honor and a privilege. It's an honor and a privilege, really, for me to be here, uh, you know, to have this opportunity on Ritik Da's birthday to speak about uh, his work and especially the film that uh, is very, very important to me. One of the, my first question to you is that, uh, and we have read that you consider uh, Riti Ghatok as your teacher. So before discussing Titash in any specific form, if you could tell us about this influence of Ghatok on you as a person and on you as a filmmaker. It takes me many, many years uh, back. It takes me back to the days of the Film Institute. Ghatak cinema is one of those rare ones that can be spoken about in many ways. And, uh, you know, as the years pass since we first saw them, every speaking of these films changes our perceptions of the film, of the films, just as it uh, changes us. Yeah. In my experience, every time I speak of Katek's films, they transform my first memories of them. 
But the extraordinary thing for me is that uh, time, which usually, you know, erases, uh, dulls, uh, forgets, uh, trivializes, has not managed to wreck any of his films in my daily life as it does with so many others. Generally in uh, mainstream cinema, image and sound, they direct attention. They present and develop characters and the narrative. All the elements that appear in an image, including sound, have a singular function, a stable identity, and are set in a hierarchy to direct the eye to the unfolding of uh, some drama. Each image then is closed, restricted to a single function. Whatever the dynamism of such an image, its flow is locked image to image to the demands of the narrative. But as soon as I started watching Ghatak's uh, cinema, it was obvious that the image for him was something totally uh, different. Ghatak's uh, image making, uh, excuse me, but uh, I must speak of uh, Titash here. For me, uh, what was an inkling while watching his other films, with Titash, I could actually articulate that feel. In Titash, all phenomena, no one element, not fire, not water, not sand or stone, nor the human body, no one element can proclaim its uh, sovereignty over the other. The Tigda's uh, compositions constantly shift uh, to juxtapose water, to wood, to the human body, to the sky, to, the, to a tree, so that each element becomes endowed with unguessed uh, kinships, new relationships. Each element then in the process of the film has its own story. Not, there is not one singular story being told but every element then becomes a carrier of a tale. Yeah. That to me was one of the first things that struck me about the cinema of Ritigda. In the gathered elements of his image, there is no hierarchical distinction. There's only an incessant uh, fluid uh, meeting, a flux of things and bodies indifferent to our usual distinctions between uh, subjective and objective, between concrete and abstract, or between uh, empirical and metaphorical. All in his cinema is, uh, is movement. Yeah. What we are left with is the resplendence of uh, change. I believe that's the reason we keep retu returning to Ritigda's films. There is something strange and paradoxical at work in his films. Every time we watch them, they keep on upending whatever conceptual grids we impose on them. Every viewing transforms them as much as us. Finally, his gift, uh, yeah, his gift really to us is uh, no one truth, but speculation and reflection. Not one narrative, but a proliferation of stories. And finally, not continuity, but the strength to celebrate change. This are some of the elements of watching Ritigda in the early days that completely overwhelmed me. And now as time passes, they have become very, very important to my thinking about cinema, about image making, about sound. I mean, we wanted to talk about this aspect of change in Ritika's cinema because 
uh, particularly in Titash, because I remember there was this character who starts the conversation, you know, in the beginning of Tita saying this river might not be the same anymore as will be the human beings and all of that. And that comes back at the end. So, you know, his cinema has always been a witness to this change, like this slow, painful deterioration of human life. And as well as there's also a celebration of the new, the evolution that's coming out of it. So how, how do you, you know, what is your perspective to that? Why do you think that change always comes back to his cinema? It's a very, very important question. Let's look at it in this way. All right. What is a civilization? How and why do they fade away? What do we choose to remember about them? And what do we seek to preserve? These, of course, are the questions of our time in India today. As I mentioned earlier, there is something strange and paradoxical at work in Ritik Da's films. Over time, they keep on overturning whatever conceptual grids we impose on them, but certain themes uh, prevail. On the one hand, our attempts to understand the themes and symbols in Ritik Da's films seems to risk the very delusive uh, logocentrism that the films themselves seek to challenge. Simultaneously, we can't help but see the recurrence of uh, what I suppose we could call a pastoral theme, a self-sufficient community, in the case of Titash, a fishing community, represented as a kind of ideal, distant from politics, corruption, change, and therefore from time itself. It's an idea of an ideal home. Mm -hmm. Such a community comes into being by keeping the outside out, which means that uh, it's meant to contain itself, not enter history, and keep reaffirming the dream of changelessness offered by the ideal of uh, the pastoral order. You know? Every civilization, as it begins to recognize the pressure of change within, will seek to escape from uh, history. And the pastoral myth, this ideal myth of self-sufficiency, serves the purpose quite well. This is the destructive turn of the cycle. However, in uh, Ritik Da's work, again and again, and in Titash, uh, brilliantly, extravagantly, uh, we see a traumatically intense uh, interrogation of the pastoral impulse. Nothing ever stops moving. And that is the irrepressible movement within every image and sound in Titash. This Irrepressible movement coming into being in Titash emerges more from the flux of the terrain, not just the narrative. The movement, the relationship of one element to another is potent, transformative, metamorphic, like the character of Basanti, metamorphosing from compassion to protest, from a simple fisherwoman to a fierce Durga, Mm. The other elements in the film don't stop flowing into each other either. For movement, action, participation in the flux at, is at the heart of experience and is the only alternative in the cinema of Ritik Ghatak to destruction. Deny this irrepressible movement for change and we invoke destruction. I mean, you have put it so well, and that brings uh, me to this one, one, you know, kind of motif that I find in his film. You, you can tell me if I, if I, if I think it correctly. But there are so at times 
these characters, I feel like they go through a kind of a sine wave. Like, you know, uh, there's, there's some spark of joy in their life and suddenly there will be something happening. Uh, like if I remember, you know, the small Shita is singing in Shuborno Rekha, uh, just, you know, around this airport area and all. And suddenly there is this Kali, Kali, uh, you know, figure coming and the song stops. Similarly, in Komol Gandhar, the, uh, you know, they are all singing in the train and then there is this, the bridge stops. Here in Titash also, I see, you know, the couple, Rajaji and um, Kishore, they kind of connect, then disconnect, then they connect back. And then when he recognizes her and, you know, calls her Bo, my wife and all, then they suddenly, again, they, 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 they both die and they get departed. So is this also, you know, something he keeps on harping at, like, you know, this is all transcendental, this is all for a moment and it is to pass. Both uh, Bans Rajaji, Basanti, or even Kishore, the madman, you know, are in are in Titash uh, figures of irrepressible change, and any community that seeks to escape history, to deny change, needs uh, sacrificial uh, victims, like the great figures of religion, like some of our Sufi and Bhakti saints like uh, lovers in our love legends, these figures are sacrificed to protect the community. But just as often, these sacrifices, they stir, uh, they stir a change. Historically, and even today, we can see how a community will sacrifice what is best about it. That is what we see in the cinema of Ratik Ghatak again and again. That we have a tendency to sacrifice what is best about us. You know. uh, sometimes the desire is very simple. To remain as we are, changeless. But sometimes these kind of sacrifices, they do create a change in conscience. A change, uh, they bring a force into the community which is no longer deniable. And I think uh, Ratikta is saying that to us again and again. Why do we need this sacrifice? You re you're really making me think and I'm like, <laughs> now I'm not able to remember the next question because I, I am so deep into what you said. <laughs> but I will just... I will just go uh, into it. Uh, you talked about Rajarji and Bashanti, and uh, they do have a very strong voice in their expressions of passion and protest. Uh, then the other leading ladies in Ghatok's films, but even there, they converge to a similar fate like the others. Like, what is your take on this eventuality of women in Ghatok's film? Like, I think you uh, you like you touched upon this in the last question. But when you talk about specifically about uh, Bashanti and Rajarji and other women, even in spite of they being a, a lot more vocal, a lot more expression expressionist, uh, they have the they have the same kind of fate in the end. Um, what do you think about that? This is precisely what we were talking about. You know what I said just now that there are communities uh, that, that seem to ask for these kind of sacrifices. You know, they are locked in some kind of changelessness. They are locked in some kind of ideal. And uh, um, here are figures uh, which are asking for change, which are actually figures of change, they are figures of transformation. And a community can't uh, live with that. They have to sacrifice these uh, figures. And uh, these are the best figures, <laughs> of course, uh, that belong to the community. You know, as I said, these are figures as important as some of the great figures in, uh, in religion. You know, or in uh, or amongst our Sufi Bhakti poets, you know, these are figures that have finally brought about a change, but they have been sacrifices, or they have been sacrificed. Yeah. 
whether Ghatak uh, believes that we need to make these sacrifices or whether this is a question to us. Mm. Do we need to make these sacrifices? You know, is uh, our uh, points of view that uh, I think can be debated. But as far as I'm concerned, the way I understand Katak's uh, cinema, I think this is an uh, accusation to communities. You know, that we really, for the sake of you know, survival of things which are sometimes already dead, we are ready to kill what could actually bring us a renewal. Do you see, Anubda, do you see a hope at the end of it? Like when you watch it, do you see that there is a, a positive, uh, like this, this sacrifice is leading to a change in community according to Ghatak, or do you see more of a hopelessness or pessimism as we draw towards these sacrifices across cultures in Ghatak's films? I think you have to keep in mind, you know, that the ending in uh, Ritik Da's uh, cinema is or comes into being through the process of the film. All right. And really, you know, look at any of his films, Ojontrik, uh, Megidakatara, Shubhana Rekha, you know, any of these films. There is a kind of example in his image making. All right. How he brings elements together, there is an exhilaration, there is a kind of life force in the very making of the film. I don't think we can allow the ending of the film to tell us what life is or is not. You know, I would say you know, that the whole experience of the film should suggest to us where uh, the Tikda actually stands uh, in his relationship to life, in his relationship to hope, in his relationship to uh, future, in his relationship to the nation, in his relationship to, you know, the very uh, many partitions that we live on a daily basis. Uh, I don't think we should allow ourselves only to look at the ending and then say, this is what the film is trying to say. Right. We should look at how the film comes to that ending, you know, with what energy and power and life force it comes to it. And can that life force then simply fizzle away? Uh, to me, no. One of the, in one of your earlier interviews, you had mentioned something which had fascinated me. You said that Ghatak had this unique ability to capture the inner force that went into the making of the outer surface. If you could please elaborate us, you know, in context of Pitash, if you feel, you know, what do you feel, why do you say so for Ghatak's films? This is a question I've thought about very, very often. And uh, it seems to me Mm -hmm. that uh, Ghatak's constant uh, gathering and juxtaposition of uh, the minuscule and immense elements in his uh, composition actually frees the elements from the axis of human vision. Let me try and go into this a little more. Uh, this is not some perspective upon the world. It is not a point of view of any of the characters. This is not a vision, you know, the general vision that we see in cinema, especially in mainstream cinema. This is not a vision that plots uh, intention in its objects. Yeah. But this is a gathering that is indifferent to our acts of vision because it is always creating a mesh of uh, relationships that our vision can no longer break and instrumentalize for our own purpose or meaning. Let me go into this a little more. 
for the lack of a better word, uh, let's call it an erotics of landscape. Moving uh, sinuously between water, sand, sky, boat, and the human body. The sinuous dance of everything in Ritik Da's composition affirms the concrete, you know, the very elemental, but it also takes on, it does not deny, the desire of human vision to imbue meaning and uh, utility into objects, people, situations, terrains. This vision, it also evokes uh, mythic and philosophical and cultural ar archetypes, but then returns, always, always returns to the material, you know, to the concrete, often in the space of a single uh, shot. This, this is an expansive vision that Ghatak brings us, a vision that is not locked in a desire to imbue singular meaning and utility to people, objects or terrains, but a vision of transformation, constantly new and changing identities and relationships. This for me is that incredible, immense uh, inner movement in, in, in the cinema of Ritti Khatak. It is this vision, which is very, very different from, you know, the usual point of view that we see, all right, or uh, a vision that gives you a certain kind of reality, relationships between foreground, midground, background, you know, uh, a vision that tells you that this is uh, the hierarchy of objects and the human body or face, which is the most important. And therefore that leads to a kind of action in a terrain that you hardly see, you know, to then tell you one single story. The thing that's vision his way of looking, his choice of lens, how he juxtaposes various elements together, simply creates a very, very different kind of uh, image. I, I, I can't even call it an image. That's why I call it a vision. You know, it's a very, very different vision uh, for us. I understand what you say because my personal feeling in a lot of uh, cases while watching a Ritikhatak film has been, you know, there has been, so suppose this one montage, uh, I have loved it, but I'm not sure what connected me to that one, but in particular. So I kind of come, go back to that particular montage, you know, I, I, I go back and see that particular uh, section once more. But I will not be able to, you know, pinpoint, you know, this is what I relate to most, but it is the overall impact that I have, you know, from, from those montages. I particularly remember one from Titash where uh, this young guy, Anunto, uh, he is wanting to get into this boat and uh, the sellers, they, they, they do not want to take him and they leave him away. And he's trying to push the boat, he's trembling and the boat goes off. And then, you know, the, the water lilies kind of come. The, the wide angle lens which we want to talk about, you know, they come and surround him. So it's such a beautiful scene. You do, do not need to have the, you know, what is happening in the film to appreciate it or to get suddenly get connected to it. True, true. This um, is what I'm trying to say, that the kind of vision or the kind of image that uh, Ritikda has built is not the kind of image that we are, or image or vision, that we are used to in cinema. Mm -hmm. yeah. He has within the domain of, or the realm of the image, brought things which, which are not static. All right. If you want to tell a singular narrative, then the elements need to be static. They need to have 
singular identities so that, uh, you know, we understand that this is related to this in this way and therefore the human figure is like this and therefore there is a cause and logic uh, to the development of the story. All right. With Ritikda, you, you really, you pick up any one of his images and you don't get that. What you get, as I was saying earlier, is, you know, this juxtaposition of uh, body, sky, water, tree, uh, sand, stone. You know? So when they are juxtaposed like that, uh, within uh, uh, the wide angle lens, which creates, uh, you know, distorted, if you like, distances and intimacies between them. It creates new relationships. This is not the kind of relationship, these are not the kinds of relationships that we can easily uh, give meaning to. You know? We have to allow each element then to tell its story. So the body is water, just like the body sometimes of a simple fisher woman suggests uh, a goddess, yeah. a human uh, hand, sometimes just the texture of the hand is like that of a tree. Yeah. A woman walks across the frame with the same kind of rippling effect of uh, water. What is this happening in uh, Ritikda's uh, image making? Yeah. There is a suggestion. There is a suggestion that identities are not stable. Yeah. Just like uh, Rajaji's young boy, Adonto, Adonto. Yeah. is is a, is a orphan at one point. Yeah. But at one point, he's also young Krishna, you know, to Mungli, Mungli who plays a kind of Radha-like role, uh, the elderly woman who suddenly becomes a Radha to this young Anantu. You know. These kinds of transformations are not only transformations that are happening in the story. I'm asking all of us to look at these transformations which are always there in the image making itself. Look at the sky, look at the relationship of the human body to the sky. Look at the relationship of uh, stone to water. You know, look at the relationship of wood to face. Yeah. These kind of transformations are happening constantly in the cinema of Ritika Tuk. That is why we can speak about, uh, speak of a cinema as an epic cinema. It is a cinema that constantly expands, breaks and expands our ways of looking. That is uh, the vision that I'm talking about, or that is the image making that I'm talking about. Right. There's another thing very interesting that I find, I'm not sure uh, if you think that way, uh, is uh, a lot of references to uh, Hindu goddesses are yeah. the characters, you know, Durga, Sita, Vashanti and all of that. But he's not into rituals. I mean, I remember this, this marriage that happens, um, uh, Rajaji and uh, Kishore. They will just go, there's a folk song playing and uh, they put the garland uh, on each other and that's it. So that's also very interesting that I find that at one hand, he keeps on referring to uh, the mythological characters, but he has never get, getting into, you know, the, the rules kind of which, which bind us in terms of religion. Um, I mean, there are rituals in uh, the Tikda, but not uh, um, these kind of social, cultural, religious rituals that we are used to. You know, in Megita Katara, for instance, it's full of rituals. Uh, but these are, uh, let's say, cosmic rituals. Uh, they have suggestions of certain 
mythical elements to them, you know, especially the boiling rice, the courtyard, you know, um, the mother-daughter relationship. All right. So there are these kinds of things. There's also in Shubhana Rekha, you know, other kinds of rituals. In, uh, in Titash, for example, the way he uses uh, uh, the, the wedding tune, Lila Bali, Lila Bali. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So without actually showing the ritual, if you like, yeah. he does by using certain elements of uh, social, cultural, religious ritual, suggest a larger ritual. Uh, which then, of course, makes us relate to you know things in a very different way. We can talk about the editing a little bit since you talked about the imagery. It also <laughs> follows like uh, typical episodic natures of Ghatok's films with a certain kind of alienation effect. If you could talk about the editing style of Ghatok and how does it fit into the politics of his cinema? As you might have noticed, you know, I'm uh, trying to as much as possible. You know, I'm trying to talk about uh, my experience of Ritik Da's uh, cinema in a very personal way. Yeah. Yeah. I have a very, very great regard and I have great friends who have created a, a magnificent critical language uh, on the cinema of Ritik Da. Yeah. My teachers too, Kubashani, for example. However, as filmmakers, when you hear Kumar Shani speaking outside uh, certain discourse, uh, outside certain formal discourses, you know, then there's a different language that uh, comes into being. And I am trying in that way to follow my master. And uh, uh, speak a language which is my language of of the experience so in, in short <laughs> to uh, come to your question about uh, the editing i let me say let me talk about the editing in in a larger sense uh, of the word and perhaps uh, that will give us uh, an insight into the patterns of editing in Titash. All right. So I'm talking about editing, not simply, you know, as the cutting of one image into another, but I'm trying to, I will attempt to try and talk about editing um, in the very, uh, body of the film, which is then what might lead to the editing patterns that we see uh, uh, technically. Yeah. Um, with Titash then, you know, we are at the river's edge. The terrain of the river as a site for political and spiritual testing and self-scrutiny has uh, ancient roots from Vedas to Purans to uh, present day ecological concerns. And this tradition uh, of uh, looking at the terrain, not simply for its uh, beauty or its uh, geography, but for what is secreted within it, its history, you know, is a very, very important question or tradition uh, that shapes uh, Ritik Da's uh, cinema. His uh, river terrain is an actual and ethical space which provides the testing ground for moral positions assumed by his uh, protagonists in the face of self, society, and uh, universe, uh, which apparently is bent on uh, destruction. 
Here, Ritik Da deliberately interweaves landscape, perception, and politics in a way that enables him to develop a disturbing discourse of uh, power and loss. A terrain is never without its uh, cosmic uh, inflection, nor is it separate from issues of uh, ownership, exploitation, and uh, domination. The film plunges us into the legacy of our terrain, the repository of our history, tradition, fact, myth, and mystery. So there are, in a cinema, the terrain is not simply, you know, uh, a vertical, a horizontal, something that we cross or something that we sit in. Yeah. The terrain is already alive with our past, with our traditions, and with our politics. Yeah. So the editing has to be seen you know, in a much more, uh, in a larger sense. Let me try and put this in another way. Ritikda gives voice to the landscape, as well as all inhabitants of the terrain, uh, be they community leaders, exploiters, outcasts, children, uh, mothers, daughters, madmen, you know, everyone is given a voice. But as I was saying earlier, he also allows the sky its uh, expression, as he does water, as he does a boat, as he does a tree, you know, as he does this lilting the lily that uh, uh, floats across the water. All of them are allowed a voice through the reminiscences, observations, parables, songs of even the most incidental characters. He's able to fold the past into the present, the personal into history. In this way, he can develop an ongoing examination or even an internal critique of the functions and forms of storytelling. Yeah. Ritik does a film like his mad, prejudiced, yearning, lost characters are perpetually seeking to bear witness to their truth. That is to tell who they are what uh, their world is, and just as important, what they would like their world uh, to be. These uh, multiple voices that attempt to bear witness to their life creates the flux of the film, bringing past, present, notions of future into a very powerful debate. Through the juxtaposition of these various voices, we never really attain clear-cut ideas of plot. You know? And this is true for all his films. Give me a clear-cut idea of the plot of Subhana Rekha, you know, And please try and do that for me with uh, Titash. You know? What is the clear-cut plot of uh, Ojomtri? We reduce these films make them really nothing when we try and simply speak to each other of the plot of these films. So these various, through these various voices, we, we attain no clear cut idea of plot or ideology, but an ability to listen to multiplicity. We learn the art of listening and reflecting and questioning each other as well as ourselves. We learn that listening to the questioning that we do 
for each other, towards each other is crucial. That how we tell our stories, how we bear witness to each other and our world, how we construct time passing from the past to the present is what is our true responsibility uh, as, as people, as community, as artists, as filmmakers. And I think this is what we see in uh, Ritik Das films again and again. This is what his films do. They bear witness to a time, a place, its people, their uh, celebrations and their destruction and forces us to ask ourselves now in this time, are we so different from them? How can we bear witness to our lives, the lives of others, our many and different worlds? How can we tell our story so that they do not seek to be the only truth? And even in their telling, that they do not divide us and destroy us. What is this story that we need to speak? Yeah. Stories do not affirm truths, but encourage questions and never tiring speculation. It is out of this sense of Story, which is stories, people who are peoples, landscape, which is history, um, terrains, which carry traditions. It is out of all these elements then that a certain idea of juxtapositions, of montage, then arises. So the editing, if we now come back really, you know, in uh, technical terms uh, to your questions, the editing then is not of one shot to another shot. You know? The editing is really to one story, to another story, to another story, to three stories, four stories, you know, all these elements coming together so that at the end of the film, we are not left with, you know, uh, a meaning or a single significance. We are left with this world that he has created for us, which is a world of multiple stories which are happening simultaneously. Yeah. That is what we need to see in his editing. You know, that is what gives his editing the evocativeness all right, that uh, so scintillates us. You know. This is not an editing of one movement into another. This is an editing where worlds are juxtaposed to each other. Peoples are juxtaposed to each other. There is within it a need to uh, celebrate. There is, within that editing, there is a need to face what it is that destroys us. And there is the need to question this impulse, this force of destruction. I think that is the power of his editing, you know, that he's teaching us again and again to fight forces that seek to uh, destroy. Uh, you want to talk more about this use of wide angle lens because I know you are very passionate about that. You know, this image making that Gata does through his lenses. Well, you know, I think the wide angle lens is what actually allows Ritik the, to do all that I've been suggesting that he does. There is, there is this kind of, obviously, the wide angle, you know, brings an expansiveness. 
But what it also does is that it can create uh, incredible foregrounds or incredible backgrounds. Yeah. It can really stretch them out. It can uh, create distances uh, which are not necessarily the distance on the terrain. Uh, the, uh, it can also bring uh, uh, conjunctions uh, which, again, need not necessarily belong to the terrain. But I think what is very, very important uh, to think that for using, let's say, generally if he uses the 24 mm, you know, in, in the Titash, certainly, you know, in Titash, in fact, he even goes to 16 mm. Yeah. Uh, is that it really allows him to gather things, you know, not to uh, do what uh, other cinema does, which is, you know, to say, not this, not this, because it's not my story, you know. Mm. Always uh, concentrating, framing for the story. Ritikda yeah. seems to be doing the opposite. This and this and this, because everything is a part of my story. Yeah. Because my story is many stories. That to me is uh, uh, the reason why he keeps on coming back to the wide angle. Yeah. That it allows him to create a world where there is not a sense of denial. It allows him to create a world where there's not a sense of one single truth. But instead, allows him to conjure, all right, or suggest, or evoke. Yeah. Our world, as uh, we might experience it, it in moments of great uh, exultance, of rupture, that everything is related to everything else. That my story is impossible without the sky that is there above me, the ground on which I have my feet, this wind that blows across me. You know, How can there be a, my story without these elements? So the wide angle lens. <laughs> this was such a uh, spiritual experience for us, Anubda, talking about uh, Ghatok, Ritik Ghatok with you. And uh, I think our appreciation of Ritik Ghatok increased several folds. And it's still, for me at least, it's still muddy. I uh, But still, I have a lot of clarity, a lot more clarity than what I had uh, before this discussion on uh, Tita Shakti Nodin Nam. Uh, so thank you, Anubda, for giving us so much time. We really appreciate uh, everything that you did for us today. This is uh, um, this is our good fortune that uh, there's something like this materialized uh, for us. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. very kind of you. I, I enjoyed uh, this conversation very much. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my teachers.